welcome to the course International Studies in Vernacular Architecture. Today we are going to talk about timber as vernacular building material. So much of the literature has been addressed in Brunskill's work about types of timber houses, the crack frames and how they are constructed, the construction techniques. So I am going to give you an overview of these timber construction techniques which we can commonly found in Europe. England and many other parts of American continents. So after this we will going to have some small introduction with in the Indian context especially in the hill states of Uttarakhand how the timber houses are even till today they are existed and how they are maintained. And we are also going to discuss about how the tradition versus modernity are negotiating with each other in the current context with the help of two cases with Alto Mayo caves in Peru and as well as Uttarakhand caves in India. So when we talk about the timber frame buildings or the wooden houses, wooden architecture we call. So some of the common types especially in the colder parts of European continent whether in Sweden, Norway or Finland like for example this house is from Levy, Finland, this is a cottage in Levy where the ski resorts are there and even till today many of them still live in these timber houses, log houses. And the simple technique is you know they have these horizontal logs which actually interlock, interlock at these junctions and that actually formulates as a dwelling unit. You know it's a very simple technique of making a wooden house. And the advantage of this wooden house is it can keep you warm inside during the cold conditions and during the summer times it can give you some cold conditions inside. So similarly you can find many such places where the whole villages were completely built with wooden architecture like once I was doing some work in Jacopano in Poland and I could see the whole village is completely whether it is a monastery, whether it is a church or any other things everything is built with completely with wood because of the harsh climatic conditions they have adopted the local materials. And the kind of techniques they have adopted is not only the log house what we can find in the northern part of Scandinavian countries but here we can find the wood cladding and we also find the timber frame buildings as well. So in many of these traditional houses we can also find how these framed construction mix with the earthen material as well you know so how the, uh, the traditional houses demonstrate the combination of materials both timber and the low materials in the construction. For example in the Stratford upon Avon we, we can see that it is having a combination of both the timbers as the structural elements or it is actually filled with these low materials. Very much in the heart of London you can see the Liberty Mart in London you know that also you can see a similar model of the combination of wooden and the other composite low materials. When we talk about the types of built forms especially used in the timber frame constructions are one is box frame. There are actually four types. One is box frame. In the box frame what you can actually see is you have they are divided into different base and you can see that there is this cross frames you know so you have these segments which actually divides the whole building into different base and over that you are going to get a roof elements but here you don't find something which is connecting all the purlins which is connecting these roof elements. It is like basically acts like a cover or you know as like a lid on a vessel you know so that is how it is framed. Whereas the second model where we can see is the post and the truss. So here we can see the kind of truss which is an, a, a uni unified factor in this and we can see there are common rafters and these purlins which are actually connecting these trusses together you know the purlins which makes an important role because that is where all the trusses are connected together. The third model is the ailed construction here we can see that especially this is very prominent in when we are doing construction of churches 
or any religious or any other forts or any other public buildings. So where we can see that there is a nave which is uh, created with the two arcades along and these are referred as a kind of arcade post and which actually make these ales and over that the roof is made. So the most important form is the crack type construction. Here they will actually collect the inclined timbers and they try to make a kind of a frame and they try to assemble it and they join it with these ridge beam or the ridge berlin. So here this is the tie beam and these are the crack blades here because from the bottom we have let's say we call the sill beam or a sole plate and we can say I'm going to show you the joinery of this and so that is how this these uh, inclined member is joined here with these crack blades and again these purlins are there as we found in the uh, post and trust model. These purlins actually bind all these systems. So the more detailed version of these crack frame buildings, one of the example in Lester's, we can find that you know see the timber frame, the inclined members are actually formulated as an A frame and they are assembled at the ground and read one by one into a vertical position so that the ridge purlin and the side purlins and the wall plates could be dropped onto their sockets and tie the frames together. So here we can see these wall plates and then we have these based on the ridge fold you can have these kind of roof structures and the tie beam which connects the whole structure and the collar beam at the top which creates a kind of attic space and then the infill material could be a stone wall and you can have the brick filling, you can have the stucco or older wall materials. So, so like that the variety of materials could be composed within these compartments. So on the top what we can see is there is a kind of lap joint come like this and the ridge purlin passes through that and that is how the joinery is made. So when you actually see that you know we can see that in this particular diagram there are two closed and one open truss that's the kind of model and here you can see the joinery of at the sole plate or the sill beam where you can see a lap joint and this is where the inclined member starts and this is where the vertical member is there. And whereas you can see the frame of these two base in length with post and wall plates connected by the tie beams with a stud and rail infill wall. So here this is where the infill material will be placed upon. So again similarly we can see the corner post rising from the timber sill supported by, so these are supported by the angular braces. So that is basically about the kind of structural form, but let us come to the construction elements how we use for the filling material. So one of the prominent technique is Vattel and Daub technique. So here if you can notice like these are the staves, I think if these wooden logs are actually making these compartments and the horizontal rails and the vertical studs they actually make a square panels and within that you have these uh, staves which are actually pushed into these upper side and the lower side of it. So in that way they actually formulate a grid within this box and then the wattle is woven in alternate directions you know like we have this in one onto this side and the other onto this side. So in that way a pattern is also created and in the bottom of this staves so this is how the detail is all about how this stave is going to sit on it and in the top it is having a groove uh, above and it will be fixed onto it. So once this is done then the infill material whether it is a tin plaster coating will be filled from both sides. So this Vattel and Daub construction is not very recent, it even we can found in the Pebello Indians houses, traditional pit houses where the, uh, dates back to the 3rd century AD and we can see that this whole roof structure is completely made with the wet loam infill in the skeleton structures and there are also many advancements which we can find the people have adopted the prefabricated Vattel Daub system in Brazil and also we can see the Vattel and Daub buildings in the Venezuelan country. So here again they see that you know they actually do some infill material within this frame and then they 
plaster with these wet loam plasters. Depending on the soil conditions, depending on the loam conditions, where it is available, what kind of binding elements it has, whether it is a soil content, silt content, clay content, you know. So all these things they will look into it. And then if there is any stabilizers that they may have to add and then they try to apply it onto the surfaces. So on a similar note, there is another model which we should also discuss is the cob buildings, you know. So where this is frequently observed in the Devonshire, England and which has become widespread in around 15th to 19th century in the Devonshire in England. And this is uh, where you can see the raw tree trunks actually formulated these panels, you know, the kind of spaces for the windows and the infill material. And then here what they do is they actually, a man stands with a three-pronged pitchfork on the plinth of the wall and whereas the second man forms the clods, you know, which is basically the balls and as large as two fist and the second man then throws to the claws to the first one and he catches that into the pitchfork and walking backwards, throws from onto the wall. So he also compacts the wall with his feet wherever it is needed. So when we talk about the external facade elements here, we can actually notice that within that once the timber studs have formulated as a frame, then people also do with the tiling as a cladding material. So here we can see that how the tiles are fixed, once the studs are uh, frame is fixed, then you can see the battens over there, maybe they may range up to 45 mm to 50 mm or and then they have these regular intervals and then there is a triple layered here you can see that the triple layered uh, mathematical cladding uh, process. So different varieties and different formats could be developed within that. And there are different shapes of tiles which comes in the market and how they can use this as a cladding material. And in the present building industry, what we can actually see is, you know, now that the cladding material has been advanced and it has been produced as a mathematical tiles, you know. So these tiles are uh, nothing but, you know, they are uh, initially introduced around 17th century and they are weather tight old uh, timber, uh, fill, uh, timber frame buildings. And what they do is they actually use the same principle of having the battens on the external facade and with different shapes. For example, this is a corner tile so that you know you don't see the joinery of the studs also. So in that way you can actually prepare in the way you want for the building requirement. And similarly, uh, we use weather boards and this is also in the similar technique like here, you know, uh, we have these battens and they overlap to one another. and. Generally, the way it has to be fixed onto this side because the rainwater, when it falls, it has to drive from top to down. It will never going to be like this because otherwise the rainwater go inside. Okay, so there is a methods of how you apply these weatherboard cladding. And nowadays, of course, they are also using certain ACP panels or the aluminum panels also in the cladding material. And when it comes to the traditional representations, especially in Suffolk area, we can actually find these paragating techniques which they have actually used these plasters and they actually do these decorative elements, you know. So they actually make these facades interesting with these paragating techniques. So here what they do is they have different formats with interwoven things and concentric patterns and zigzag patterns. So in that way, this is a kind of decorative element even till today they are using it. And we talk about the timber walling with the brick nogging technique. So as I said, once the frame is done and the studs and their sill plates and the roof plates, once the frame is done, so basically the infill material we have talked about, wattle and daub technique, we have talked about the cladding techniques and the brick nogging technique is also an important factor. So you can arrange these bricks in different directions in a different zigzag pattern here or uh, you can see that they can also, if it in the same house, you can see they are arranged in different patterns. Here you can see a zigzag pattern and here they are arranged in an inclined pattern in one direction, an inclined pattern in another direction. So in that way, uh, a patterns could be created with this process. So the detail of it, if you look at it, you know, so this is how the detail could be worked out. And to be having more clear understanding of, so you can see that brick has been knocked within these spaces. and that's how the patterns are created and they are actually followed uh, a particular typical element uh, in both the cases if you see like uh, they are following some similar patterns on either side of it. 
So that is a kind of background on uh, how the timber building, the wooden architecture was there and how different types of buildings do exist and how different patterns of the construction elements do exist. But now we are going to talk about how these traditional elements, how they actually respond within this modern setups, you know, modernities. So I'm going to talk about two different contexts. One is in the Peru context and the other one is in the Uttarakhand context. So in the work of uh, Theo Schilderman's work where he talks about the adapting traditional shelter for disaster mitigation and reconstruction and his experiences with the community-based approaches. So basically he talks about different cases and I'm going to talk about one particular case here and especially with this Alto Mayo region, where uh, in from 1990 and 1991, there's a series of earthquakes which has impacted these areas and many injuries and many deaths have been reported and many people lost their houses. About 6,000 homes were destroyed or damaged. So what they did was, because uh, the existing adobe construction techniques, so they tried to discard that process because of the earthquake conditions and now they want to improve a kind of structural reinforcement and they have adopted the local quincha techniques, the timber frame. And uh, so what they did was uh, the technique is in a very simple form and you have this wall and this quincha, there's basically the, the wattle or the beam which is woven into that. So in the previous discussion we thought of the staves on coming onto the vertical but here it is also coming in the horizontal level and these staves are interwoven at these three directions. And then uh, for instance if you can see these that when the two panels are joining, you can see that you know they are they are just slightly overlapping above one above the other, so that we can nail to each other, you know, for the nailing purposes also. And then there's a two layers of coat will be applied, and here you can see this is the sections of these uh, bamboo and uh, oven fill process. You know that you have the floor level, and this is how the bamboos are intertwined like this, and. So uh, for instance, we have uh, the concrete pad and the strip foundations, the mix is about 1 is to 10 plus 30% of the large stones in the concrete in the foundation process and whereas the wall base it is about 1 is to 8 and wood as a structure, uh, wood is actually composed with the structural quality poles. So in terms of the ren render, there are two coats. The first coat is done with the mud and straw and the second coat with the cement lime and the sand, so in the ratio of 1 is to 1 is to 5. So when they actually adopted this particular improvised quincha technique and uh, they constructed these houses in 1996, it was costing about uh, 1300 US dollars and whereas similar equivalent structure made out of brick was costing about 5400 US dollars. So that is how this has proved efficient, cost efficient and it has also able to prove because of its lightweight in nature, so it has uh, been uh, proved a successful model. So in fact, what kind of impact that this pro project has brought? Of course, I'm not going to talk to you about the whole project management and other things, but I'm just going to talk about the final outcome of it. And in the 1994, it has only 558 improvised quincha houses built in Altomayo province. But and it only formed in 1993, it only has 7% of the national housing stop. And but when this project area, within this project area, it has rose to nearly 30%. So people have understood the essence of this improvised techniques and they gradually adopted these techniques in their places. So in that way, there is some improvisation process observed in it. So that is one case where traditions has been improvised and people have accepted and it has been scaled up further independently also. In the Indian context, I'm going to discuss you about some of the timber buildings, uh, wooden architecture in Uttarakhand and uh, especially these are some of the places in Gangotri and Emunotri region where we were doing some studies earlier and there are uh, many uh, communities, Rajput communities, Bhutiyas who lives over there and they have been uh, surviving in these harsh conditions. So this is one of the village of Bagori near uh, Harsil and we can see this Katkuni style of architecture where you have these horizontal bands of wooden members and then the stone walls in the alternate layers. So uh, they are best proven as a kind of 
uh, traditional earthquake uh, formats because uh, you know the alternate lay the, these wooden bands act as like a sill band and the lintel band what we use in our regular constructions. So they are being uh, proven very efficient and you can see that there is very linear village and this is a kind of traditional character of this village. They have the Buddhist monks, the temple and their whole dwellings are made with uh, of course usage of the pillars as well as the top floors and the railings and the roofs are made completely with the, and the floors are made with the wooden uh, elements and the, even many of the houses are completely made with the wooden elements. So these were uh, these people used to live uh, before in Nelong Valley, and after the war they moved here and then they settled here. And during that time they constructed using these timber houses. But if you look at it, the kind of artisans, the kind of craftsmanship they invested, you know, that is uh, very interesting. And today, unfortunately, you don't find such uh, craftsmen who can do this kind of meticulous work. You know, so uh, there are some linguistics associated to it, there are some signs and symbols associated with their house friends and their belonging. But many of these people, they have to live four months during the harsh winter times in the downhill areas, maybe in Duda area, and then they mostly come in the summer times and live here. So in this process, nowadays only the ancestors, you know, their elderly people are living, ended up living here. And so many of them, they tried to migrate to nearby towns. And some of the houses are abandoned in nature. And some of these, you can see that they are actually modifying some of their techniques. You can see that they are adopting a similar outcomes. But the problem uh, now they are facing is they cannot access the timber because with the Forest Regulation Act, now each family they are only permitting probably one tree. But to make one house, they may need completely about nine, ten trees. You know, so but today it is not possible. It is a, it is almost a dream for them to have a wooden house. So still they are able to come up with kind of negotiation with the traditional qualities and what they are able to get in the local market. They are going to get these AAC blocks or the concrete blocks, and they are trying to blend with these cultures. So here, even the heights, that the window opening sizes which they had. So though it is the the modern craftsmen, the modern elements which they are bringing out, but somehow they are trying to negotiate with what they have and what they are trying to adapt with it. So of course, these are all the examples which communicate different meanings, how the new materials are bringing uh, a different, because obviously they feel that these are not very good for their climatic conditions. And similarly, their storage of the grains, you know, so all these, this is a storage for their grains because four months, five months, uh, what they do is, they actually store all these grains for the next whole winter time and then so that they can survive on it. So because they have a small under the, uh, I mean underground floor, so where they actually store all these food products. And now with the newer materials, because that is what locally available for them right now, because the cement concrete blocks can come by a truck and they can uh, make it. And even the local masons who are uh, settling in the nearby towns or nearby taluks, they can come and do these constructions. But unfortunately, they are not able to find any of these craftsmen who can actually do their uh, traditional buildings. So similarly, uh, we can see that uh, many buildings which are getting abandoned. So one of these families, they don't know, they left to a, they migrated somewhere and their house was lying decayed for many years. So in that way, we can see many number of these houses in different villages. And also the famous Koti Banal techniques, what we can see is the tower shaped structures and uh, almost uh, 20, 25 rooms existed in these kind of uh, buildings. And uh, these are very famous in this Koti Balan area. And so similarly, uh, some of these houses are also completely made with a wooden and uh, loam material. And here, this is an example of where 28 rooms existed in this particular house and people still maintain these houses. But the newer things which have come for them is like you know, the gas cylinder, the cooking gas. They are actually able to get the new toilet uh, systems, you know. So all these things, there are some new adaptations we can observe in these processes. And the temples, the traditional temples, which are finely carved and because that is the symbolic representation of their craftsmanship, how they showcase their belonging and the kind of respect, the kind of faith they have in these particular temples. 
and this is one of the in interior of these uh, storage houses you know the where they store so they go inside and then it's almost uh, a half a meter and then they go inside and then you can find actually all these wheat barley or grain the rice everything is stored in that so it's so that they can use it for the rest of the period so these are some of the traditional uh, techniques but today what you see actually commonly in these villages is many of these traditional houses are getting abandoned and the newer constructions are coming into the picture but uh, one has to really understand you know are they really not able to qualify for this or why are people why are people able to go for the newer construction this is something one really have to inquire and even after the disaster one can see after the earthquake uh though this house has uh got some minor repairs and it is not safe to live here but you can see the inclined facade and people they construct a new house next to it but still the elderly people they still live in this house and they cook there because they were they have their attachment in these particular houses and they feel comfortable because of the cold climatic conditions and what the kind of uh uh you know the comfort level they get in this particular houses the similar model they have people have abandoned and they will start building a new house in this uh next to each other now after the and this is somewhere near amunotri there's a village near karadi and uh, where some of them were affected their hotels were affected their houses were affected and now uh, in response to this what they did was they got their they have their own land and they constructed um, in a completely modern uh, responses so this is one thing when we went there we can see like the way uh, the tiling is done the floor tiles are there the ceramic tiles have been used and then the way we observe in our plain lands that is what the newer gra new grammar is associated in these hills but whereas for the animals they started making some of these uh, they are using the timber and they are making these elements there like you know, for animals to stay but the newer generation because they are now getting familiar with the uh, the architecture in the plains so it is actually taken into the hills also now so apart from this there are also some institutional efforts where how how to actually transfer this knowledge like for this case of pakistan the dajji diwar technique you know how the 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 pakistan government uh, the ndma pakistan they also promoted certain guidelines where uh, how can we incorporate these traditional techniques and uh, it's a kind of manual and how uh, it can help the villagers or the artisans or the construct contractors who can actually carry on these traditional technologies you know so uh, in the next class we are going to discuss on a similar issues about the advancements in the material applications thank you very much